Welcome to PM Express Business Edition. In this challenging environment, how do those who are managing the banking space survive? Or what strategies should they adopt to ensure that they stay in business to learn to you out there? The economy is going through some challenging times. Let's talk about an IMF program for us. Let's just talk about what can be done to stabilize the Ghana city. And also today, the finance minister in a press conference promised to engage all the stakeholders who matter if there should be a debt restructuring. With all these issues, I would say that it will be a great time or a great opportunity to engage one person who spent his entire life working in the space, the economy and the banking space, Mr. Hassan Antani. And he's also now a chief as well. So, Danny, how are you doing? I'm very well. It's George. been quite a while. Um, you moved on from uh, Stambik Bank, mm -hmm. where you spent quite a, a long time of your time. I know that you did uh, a stand to be corrected. Is it now APSA? And then also um, SGSSB, SG Bank now. Stanchart. Stanchart. Yeah, quite yeah. enough time in the banking space. That's correct. And finally, you said goodbye. So, what is Mr. Danny doing now, Samodax? Uh, thank you very much. As you indicated, I'm now a traditional ruler mm -hmm. and I try to spend a lot of time uh, in the Debon traditional area. Thank God we have some peace and uh, we're trying to uh, change the narrative there to development to make sure that we can continue to contribute to the economy of Ghana and bring back some economic activity in Debon. But I have also run LVS Africa, uh -huh. which is an enterprise development and business advisory mm -hmm. uh, firm, just to be able to help, especially African enterprises, you know, create generational uh, firms, mm -hmm. you know, be able to embed good governance uh, in companies, so that at least our companies can live long after the founders are gone. I know so that. that so there were people who actually. Uh, forced you into it because some would say that with all this time and this financial space, some would say you really wanted to take a bow and have some time for your traditional area and your family as well. Yes, absolutely. So as I said, I do that. Mm -hmm. I spend a lot of time in the traditional area, the family. Mm -hmm. But you know, um, as an old soldier, mm -hmm. the corporate life is always there and, mm -hmm. and I think it's good to uh, bring the good practice that mm. we we've seen other international firms embed, you know, to try and see whether we can help African companies, Ghanaian companies, you know, uh, sort of also institutionalize those practices to create uh, generational firms. Mm. How is that one doing? What's your the, the traditional name? I remember sometimes you tried to uh, help me out, but I was struggling with it. So this is a I'm the Peshugulana. Peshugulana is is within the Karaga area. Mm. Uh, Dagbang has a number of paramounts. Mm. So, but I also uh, sit in the Dagbang Traditional Council mm -hmm. and that is where we do a lot of development work. That is, that encompasses the whole uh, Dagbang Traditional How's area. How's that area doing? Quite an interesting area. Oh no, saying. I mean it's always been our cultural area and for, thank God for the peace and everything, we now have a new king mm. and uh, everybody's getting back to uh, normal life and uh, so the, uh, the whole is, uh, idea is to accelerate uh, reintegration into the formal economy and also give a lot of the boys and girls in the area job opportunities and give you know investors the confidence that they mm -hmm. can come and uh, put their monies there. A lot of opportunities in agriculture, agro processing and of course a bit of infrastructure in schools, mm -hmm. hospitals, water systems. Uh, yeah, so there are a lot of opportunities. Interesting of and, and, and I believe that the whole community has, also has come to understand how critical pieces because absolutely. that is where we can drive investment. Absolutely, in absolutely. And employment yes. and all those things. Absolutely. Peace for any area, whether it's a country, region, is the uh, primary requisite for any kind of development peace. So let's, let's come back to a very interesting space, a space that you, some would say that you spend most of your time in terms of work and more of your pulse as well when it comes to the banking space. A lot of things is happening. Let's look at the broader economy, zoom down to the banking space. Quite a challenging time and for you sit behind and what do you tell yourself that, listen, we've seen this before, go through it or this is quite a challenging time. Uh, yes, I, I must say that, you know, yeah, we've had these kind of si vicious cycles in Ghana, mm -hmm. five years, six years of boom and bust. Um, 
the bus this time is is compounded by significant uh, external uh, events. Um, the <laughs> basically even the U.S. economy, the OECD economies are all in a tailspin. Uh, then of course we have this war, which is and before the war was COVID, which uh, disrupted economies around the world and also um, supply chains. Uh, so that was already a very difficult context. And then, uh, you know, sometimes you must, you must always examine yourself critically. Mm -hmm. You know, so again, uh, we ourselves may have also uh, picked up uh, certain things that have not given us the ability to withstand mm -hmm. the global shocks. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, uh, for us, the impact of global shocks have always been the price of cocoa, the mm -hmm. price of oil and gas, you know, and uh, uh, the rest of it we've kind of managed to uh, ma maintain. But mm -hmm. uh, right now the shocks are also hugely fiscal mm -hmm. and uh, government is a significant part of the economy. Mm -hmm. Even if it was physical and the government was in a large part of the GDP, mm -hmm. uh, then you can manage it. Mm -hmm. But if you have fiscal dislocations and the government is such a significant part of uh, the, your economy, then you have difficulties. I mean, the U.S. government is probably the most borrowed government in the world. However, their share of That's GDP is not that it, huge. Yeah. They have a huge private sector. But if you have Ghana where the government and everything else government does is still a significant part of the GDP and they are overborrowed mm -hmm. and in a difficult situation, that sort of mm -hmm. just melts down everything mm -hmm. if you're not careful. Some, some say this is quite test time for the commercial banks. You've, you've survived COVID. Uh, some will say that you survived interesting times. You survived HIPIC yeah. and all the rest. But some are saying that this is the real test because, yes, of course, you were still posting some strong numbers coupled with an IMF program, coupled with externalities that are beyond yeah. your control. Yeah. Some are saying this is the real test for us to see the ingenuity or the, 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 how tough the system is in terms of these commercial banks. Correct. I mean, I think this really, uh, and I don't, uh, I don't envy any head of a bank now. Mm. Thank God. You are there. The, you you, the, you the, jump the, out of the, the ship. The pressure is there, but the impact has come right to the household level. You know, household credits, uh, are people's ability to even just do basic savings. Uh, and therefore, the banks literally have to deal with all of the risks. Number one is solvency risk, which is to ensure that whatever their commitments are primarily to their customers, mm -hmm. they can meet it. Mm -hmm. So they need to have significant liquidity mm -hmm. uh, preservation. How to preserve liquidity when people see or sense a threat that they may lose it one way or the other, or they may lose value? Mm -hmm. Are they going to take it out and try and transmute it into something physical which they can touch, or mm -hmm. they want to still leave it in the bank? And then also, you've already used the previous liquidity you mobilized to create real ask assets in the economy, i.e. loans and advances you've given for households, firms, and even to government. Mm -hmm. Those are all now being threatened because the earning ability of households, firms, and even government to pay back interest and principal is challenged. Mm -hmm. So you, what banks will want to do right now is preserve solvency, preserve liquidity, because your first calling is to those depositors. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to pay depositors any time they come into your counter. And that's why I am a little bit concerned when you hear all these issues around the banks are in deep trouble. No, the first thing they do is to preserve liquidity. Is that not the true situation when people say that the banks are indeed uh, in trouble? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, nobody has said that. The banks don't have money, but the banks are in trouble. The same as banks in UK, the same as banks in US. Sure. Uh, look at what is happening in UK right now. Yes. I mean, the, the regulator had to come in even to announce some emergency measures to deal with that. So everybody is exposed. And therefore, oh, yeah, the, the, it's not wrong if I say that the banks are in trouble in time. Yes, but you have to say it in a context that we don't deteriorate the situation because to an informed public like the let's say the banking community in Europe or the UK for that matter they are much more informed mm. than let's say your banking community in the rest of Africa Ghana mm. and the rest of Africa but having said that I think that it's, it's very much like um, when COVID hit mm. the central bank had to come in 
and put in measures to ensure that banks could adjust very quickly to the new environment, mm -hmm. you know, reducing reserve requirements, reducing capital requirements, you know, and extending uh, sort of risk profiling of, of assets and what kind of provisions to make. So they, they, are, they anticipated again, and if you look at most of what the Bank of Ghana did at that time, was to ensure that banks had sufficient liquidity mm -hmm. to respond to client needs, mm -hmm. and also that they didn't choke the economy, especially for those essential sectors of the economy that still needed credit, or those that had credit but because COVID had shut down their uh, inflows they could not repay debts mm -hmm. so you needed to give them a breather until we return to normal time so whichever way you looked at it it was about preserving the system you know making sure the banks could honor their obligations to clients making sure that whichever assets were risk assets were created were properly used and or even if it was the system was choked because let's say you were running a hotel mm. and, and the hotel was shut for a whole year. Mm. How do you pay workers? How do you pay maturing loans? So mm. we should anticipate that mm. and say to you, your principal and interest payments are suspended until such time that you can open your doors mm. to clients. Mm. It's just as simple as that. So now haven't we hid behind the fear of a bank run, the fear of people who are not informed to run on bank and the contagion effect for the industry, not to face up to the real issues facing the industry, where there are issues about bad credit, there are issues about banks, bad investments, and you, you, you even talked about governance and all those things. Yeah. There are some people out there who never believe that a day will come that there will be a banking sector cleaner because we trusted certain people to do certain work. And therefore, we always had the perception when we go to MPC and BOG reports, the banking sector is safe, the banking sector is safe. We've hid behind the fear of managing information and managing things to avoid the bank crime. And one day we woke up and we heard that X amount of banks, BOG has closed them down. Yeah. That is something that the yeah. ordinary person, yeah. that person staying yeah. in Mankesim, yeah. can forgive people like yeah. you yeah. and even the regulators. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I agree completely with you. I think what we should never lose is institutional integrity. Institutional integrity. Um, certain things may have surprised certain people because you are in the industry. But for those of us who are in the industry, yeah. we're not surprised. Yeah. And therefore, the institutions of state, whether they're in the uh, financial sector, regulatory sector, government, and other bodies, must never lose their their institutional responsibility mm -hmm. of raising the red flags at the right time. Mm -hmm. So when people say banking crisis as we had and, and the collapse, most of it wasn't crisis. We saw that these entities that failed were simply not doing banking. They were not doing banking and as it took, you know it. took it. like five years, ten years for Probably the regulator to come in? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. We should never compromise institutional discipline for keeping the society clean, mm. keeping the economy clean, and making sure that people can believe where they are going to put money. So we had all these uh, people gathering money from people and promising interest rates that were out of this world. Mm. And for those of us who were in regular banking knew that there wasn't any kind of investment that you could deploy uh, borrowed funds, I mean, cl clients' deposits to end the kind of interest rates that they were promising people who were depositing monies with them. Mm -hmm. So straight away, institutions were there, whether it was SEC, whether it was Bank of Ghana, whether it was other governmental agencies, they were there that knew that this was not right. But we allowed it. So for me, it was not crisis. We allowed thievery. We allowed wrong, just outright wrongdoing to persist for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And again, when we came to clean up, we should have allowed the institutional disciplines to work. Because if you come to a bank A, who says, look, I understand what is going on. I'll give you 15% on your deposit. And you said, no, you take that deposit and go to another institution that says, I'll give you 40%. And you make that decision. You, the investor, make that decision. Instead of leaving with a bank that will return your principal at 15%, you took the money to a bank or an institution mm. that promised you 45%. Mm. And you took the 45% for a couple of months and later on that institution disappears. And you come up and say, somebody should look after that deposit. Mm. That was for me, again, 
a difficult lesson that we needed everybody to learn. But government didn't do that. Mm. They came and protected deposits. Mm. So they would say, oh, they spent 25 billion rescuing banks. Yeah. No. They spent 25 billion ensuring that depositors didn't lose their money. Mm ensuring that depositors did not lose their money. Mm. So the 25 billion government is supposed to have spent, apart from fees and any other thing that we couldn't have traced, was to ensure that if you had uh, 100,000 with a bank that failed, you got your money back. No, at that time we had set up the deposit insurance, yeah. Yeah. which had rules that said that there is this minimum deposit when the bank fails, it's guaranteed mm. by the insurance, the deposit insurance. They'll pay that to you. Mm. And if you looked at it, at that at time, what, 6,000 6, Ghana CDs yeah. covered most households, poor households were covered. But we didn't, we didn't kick in the, the, the deposit rules. We, yeah. ignored, we put it aside and protected every single depositor. Mr. So, Mr. so that's not a classic bank failure. Mm. So it is all institutional like one or two institutions compromises that, that didn't play to the rules, and then we got ourselves into some kind of fudged exit and managed settlement. Mm. But I hope that you know. So I come back to you. The mm -hmm. point you make is correct. Yeah. That uh, you know um, somebody plays his money for Manka Siemens, trusting and Danny as MD to look after it, or Bank MA to look after it, and they can get disappointed. I hear you, that's correct. But I am saying that we should go back to where we got it wrong. We got it wrong because we did not allow institutions to do what they were supposed to do, or people who were in charge of institutions did not come in at the appropriate time they needed to come so in. Then let's talk about the peer review as well. Yeah. Some of these banks were members of the Ghana Association of Banks or Bankers as yeah. well. And I, I come back to this question about where we, we are freed of Iran, so let's even hide the saw and let's deal with it at the back without allowing the third person to see that these institutions were members of the Bankers Association. At the peer level as well, what was done to ensure that we don't get to the space? And you were the president of that session. Look, the, the asset quality review or yeah. peer review. Let me tell you what happens in the banking sector. So the banks have lines of credit with each yeah. other. Before the peer review, there were certain banks that were out of the banking, uh, call it banking clearing house. Okay. So if, you know, we you all- Who took that decision? I mean, the independent banks. I mean, sitting in a particular bank and chairing a particular treasury, we have the records of all the banks. So I think that no, no, this bank, they're not looking right. So if I have an overnight limit of 10 million, 20 million, I cut it. Mm. So for most banks that went down, their overnight limits with certain banks were already cut mm. because we knew they were not. And instead of the regulator, okay, I mean, I don't want to blame anybody, yeah. you know, stepping in at the right time, they were getting liquidity support. Yeah. But typically, the liquidity support for banking sector clears within the banking sector. Mm. In the morning, there will be a bank that has surplus cash, and they know that I can't use that. There's a bank that has uh, cash needs, so you flow it within a certain agreed mm. limit, and then it clears out the next day. All those are what we do. Mm. But when <laughs> you, are, you are chronic, I mean, you, you are always out there in the market picking and picking up, and somebody will say, what's happening to this bank? Mm. Then people start to withdraw their, so at the peer level, back to your question, at the peer level, certain banks knew that other institutions within that space were not healthy enough, mm. and therefore it cut off their lines of credit. That should have been a signal to the central bank. And if you go there for liquidity support, number one, and come back, number two, there's a problem. Somebody should be sitting there helping you to balance your assets and liabilities. You think but that this liquidity support should have been handled carefully? Absolutely. Stop doing it to them and Stop. let them go down? Yes. And that, that would have then would have had one institution gone and the others would be resolved. Instead of trying to condone as many of them as possible, then you had such a huge institutional impact. But even there, look at it. None of the your top 10, 12, 12 banks were impacted. Because it was, not it was not systemic. Systemic is where you believe that this bank was healthy and everybody was dealing with them and then suddenly they couldn't meet up. Then the default of one bank would affect a healthy bank yeah. because that healthy bank had exposures to the defaulting bank. That's systemic risk. Mm. But in the case of what happened in Ghana, there was very little systemic risk. Mm. 
because we knew those that were already at the bottom ready to go. Do you think that we should have allowed that one bank that was struggling and has come to that level of failure could let allow that bank to go yes. instead of keeping on massaging, yes. extending liquidity to that exactly. bank? Yes, exactly. And because you did it to this, if this person also was in trouble, you did the same to that person. And because, so it, you, you, you know, you create this pool of banks there that were not practicing your uh, trade as per their own laid down rules and regulation. And you, you kind of allowed that. So then after a while, that bottom becomes too heavy and dropped off. But because the top of your industry knew <laughs> that uh, these ones were not actually playing by the rules, they had cut out. So when they failed, there wasn't systemic risk, i.e. none of the other big banks, you know, blinked. Mm. <laughs> none of them blinked because they were safe. In America, there was 9-11 and they said that never again. Yeah. Do you think that as somebody who has played in this space today, September 2022, yeah. we can say never again? If I, I mean, the regulator should say never again because they have very clear-cut measures of checking the health of financial institutions. There are very clear measures of checking the health. If you see that this, in this uh, measure for these bank or banks are not, they have the secure period. You give them that time to cure it. If they are unable to cure you, move in. And they have, we have got probably the best laid down resolution, banking resolution measures, which we could do on time. And you, if we do it on time, you can actually even rescue the bank and bring it back to life and they'll be there. But, uh, so but the if you leave it for too long and the wound becomes too deep, you can't. You think that the never again question can only be answered by the regulator and ensuring that we stick by the rules. Absolutely. Never wouldn't. again is about regulator, regulation, making sure that people stick by the rules. And as I said, there are very well laid down, well tested measures of banking health, liquidity, solvency, uh, asset risk quality measurements, profitability measurements, when to pay dividend, when not to pay dividend, when to increase capital, when not to increase capital. All those things are very well laid out, well understood. They should be enforced. On time. And that's Mr. Hassan and Danny. He is a former chief executive and president, sorry, of the Ghana Association of Bankers and MD of a bank. And also is now into private consultant come to talk about corporate governance restructuring and ensure that we help those corporate institutions out there. As PM Express Business Edition, as we talk about banking, IMF economy, credit extension, and the Ghana City. All these issues wrapped up on PM Express business edition. Welcome back to PM Express business edition as we engage Mr. Larson and Diane, astute banker, somebody who has played a lot of role in the banking industry and what can you say about him? Some would say banking is in his blood. <laughs> he breathes banking, he eats banking and he sleeps banking. Mr. Danny, thank you so much and as we are still trying to talk about past events and all the rest, for you, do you think that the necessary measures have been put in place to ensure that we may not see another banking cleanup or crisis again? Um, yeah, from, from the numbers and from the publications that we've seen from the banks, there's significant growth. Uh, the health of the institution of the banks is, is looking good. And um, I, I believe the regulator is, is, is on top of the game now. Mm -hmm. and, and hopefully, I also said, never again. If they pick up any signals, they'll move in quickly. Mm -hmm. So I do hope that we will not have to come back to a banking crisis again. Caused by the same, banking crisis can be caused by different issues. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, we don't have a crisis that will impact systemic banks. Mm -hmm. The one we had before, did it impact systemic banks. Mm -hmm. yeah. So hopefully, we should continue to run the system in such a way that we don't have crises that will impact any systemic bank. Mm. Yesterday, the Minister of Finance held a press conference in the morning and tried to give the assurance that they will engage all the necessary stakeholders if it matters that they have to take a decision to restructure the country's debt. A lot of the commercial banks are holding and investing in bonds and all those things. Were you first, what do you make of this assurance by the finance minister that if they have to do this as part of an IMF program, the necessary consultation will be done. It's, 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 uh, there's no way you can restructure without the parties. Restructure mm -hmm. means there's an existing agreement between parties and that agreement has to be altered. 
So to restructure is, 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 is a prerequisite that those parties are around the table. Mm. And therefore saying that you will consult the banks and other stakeholders is the right thing to do. Some people are worried about, when this news came out, we were worried about, they were saying that if it's not managed well, there could be another run on the banks and all the rest. It comes back again to my question that if a bank is strong, yes. why should we worry about miseducated people, quote if I could use that, or a section of the public running in to withdraw their investment because of a fear of restructuring? I think it is a use of terminology. So I've heard things like haircuts. I've heard, you know, whatever banks do, what sits there primarily is shareholders' funds, which they risk. But then what is there in multiples bigger than shareholders' funds is client deposits. Mm -hmm. Those client deposits at any point in time is not the property of the bank. It's the property of depositors. Now, out of that and the structure of the economy allows banks to create risk assets. So when the risk asset is created, there's a portion of it which is capital or which is, you know, the principal which belongs to depositors and maybe some element of shareholder funds in there. So if you are doing debt restructuring and you are looking at even if banks hold uh, government paper, ensure that you're, you don't touch any portion of shareholder of shareholder of, you can shareholder funds you can but depositors money that may be sitting in those instruments mm -hmm. there is an upside to it which is the interest the bank earns yeah. you can have a discount on that interest so it's a very difficult different conversation having a discount on the interest and the haircut which sometimes could literally mean i owe you owe me 50000 Ghana cedis and i say i can only pay 25 or you owe me 100 and I say I'll pay you 50, irrespective of whose money it is. No. Mm. But if I owe you 100 and um, the uh, uh, government is paying me 25% and comes back and says I'll pay you 15%, that's not really, uh, that's an interest discount. Mm. But at least I can still return the depositors' money to them. Mm. Maybe my profitability for the period that I'm suffering that interest discount will go down. Mm. So there is, there is a, 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 there's a debt restructuring activity that can drop the profitability of banks because there's a discount on the interest that they are earning on instruments. There's also a debt restructuring that can impact the liquidity of banks because let's say if I'd laid out my investment Require, expecting that it will flow back in a year's time. And now you are saying, I want to pay you back instead of in a year, I have to pay you back in three years. Mm -hmm. So I have to find some liquidity to cover the delayed receipts. Because, you know, if you are a bank, you should be well matched. Yeah. So if I'm expecting, if I give you a loan of, a, a, of let, let's say, a thousand, expecting a hundred every month, that hundred, when it comes, it can't sit idle. Mm. Either I'm using it to pay some other obligation or I'm using it to give to a new commitment. And all those commitments should be synchronized. Mm. So if I was expecting this money, a thousand every month for, for 12 months, and now you are pushing it out two years, you understand? Yeah. My inflow has altered. If I had other commitments to pay depositors their money within that period, I need to find other adjustments. Mm. So that's why this consultation has to. So there is the liquidity management adjustment, then there is the profitability adjustment. Mm. That's where the banks come in. Mm. I have people's money which I've given out. So I need to manage the liquidity as it comes back, responding to their needs and responding to other people that I've given liquidity promises to. Then there's also my profitability mm. expectations. Mm. So mm. that's mm. where these and things and, 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 I'm, and I'm stressing on the if clause because the IMF itself has come in to explain to us that if there will be any debt restructuring, it will be guided by the debt sustainability analysis report. There could be even the out likelihood that the DSC will be done and there might not be even any need to do this debt restructuring. But Mr. Sandani, for you, if, and I, yeah, I stress on that word, if government has to go this way of a debt restructuring, for you being in the industry, what would be your advice? And I said, listen, don't touch, look up a person. And these are all just assumptions, and I want to stress on that one. But even if at the end of the day, the DSA report comes out, and then 
there is a proposal that look at how you can restructure on this. What advice would you give to government? <laughs> look, I mean, the advice would be based on certain realities that I may not have, mm -hmm. I may not be privy to, mm -hmm. but I will protect households. Of prote protect uh, households who have put their savings into these instruments. I probably p protect pensions. Uh, but yeah, there are some institutional pools of money that went into these instruments for profitability. I would not probably hit the principal, but you know, profit expectations could be called into question. Mm -hmm. And it's no different from uh, any time a particular sector of the economy uh, gets an advantage and makes huge profits, the sovereign comes back and that's what they call windfall mm. profits. So I can either tell you, no, <laughs> this is windfall for you, so don't charge. Or if it's a free market, I'll let you charge, make that money, but I'll come back as a sovereign and impose a windfall tax mm. on the particular sector. Mm. So as I said, for me it would be asset preservation for households, mm. because households are impacted by several other things. Inflation, exchange rate, everything is gone up. Prices have gone up. So whatever people have already saved, let me not diminish that for households. Mm. But there will be sectors of the economy who have pooled resources and are taking advantage of a very high interest regime to make higher profits. Mm. If that is what we are looking at, that would be manageable. But don't diminish uh, principle for, let's say, pensioners and households. So then there was a bank in this country who invested almost about 80 to 90 percent of its asset in government papers and it was being profitable and all the rest. And I mean, in school, in our banking class and investment class, we were told the safest is government paper. And, I, and I'm just saying that it is still the safest because it these are gems the assumptions here. Some again have raised questions about the investment principles and guidelines of these commercial banks that, yes, banks don't want to lend, but would prefer to dump a majority of their funds in government papers. And therefore, even if there's a challenge like this, you blame the banks because you've not spread your assets. You lock down lots of funds in government papers. But the banks are not asking for your sympathy, are they? I don't think so. No. So <laughs> they, they because they are someone saying that the banks will run down you affect liquidity and no, all. No, it's not what I'm saying. The banks are not asking for your sympathy at the moment. They know in if it's for example risk appetite choice is entirely an executive decision supported by board. When I say risk appetite choice, how much of your risk book sits in what you call risk class and other risk profiles? Mm -hmm. It depends upon the risk management capacity of this institution. And the fact that in good times you are on the government side and making money, a balanced portfolio is always better. You don't think it's wrong? So I'm saying that you dip well, everything. That's what I'm saying. The wrong from whose perspective? If it is the risk management the policy. The moral argument, someone say. The moral argument, yes. But again, who do they lend to? Government? Mm -hmm. Why is government borrowing it? Do they need it? If government needs it, is it serving the economy? Somebody has to meet that need. But if I'm sitting down, I always say that, no, it's not always government needs this money. And it's not easy to create a very good risk sector real asset. Mm. So I'd rather lend the skill of building profitable relationship with firms who are on the ground. And because with them, it's not just your interest income. There are several other related income that comes from a healthy risk profile. Mm. But you require skills to, to manage there. Mm. But that, you are not dependent on this volatility in the government. So it's also about volatility. Mm -hmm. So, and it's about the skills that sits in the bank. If the bank hasn't got that deep risk management skills and wants to stay on the safe side and there's opportunity, they will take that opportunity. There's no restriction. Mm -hmm. Or even if there are restrictions, they play within those restrictions. Mm -hmm. So really, um, I think it's choices people make. And I know there are a lot of banks who, mm -hmm probably anticipated this government difficulty yeah. and we're not buying government paper for mm. a long time. They were not mm. buying government paper. They were preserving their liquidity to do other things mm. which are not impacted by government. So the, the spread of your risk book is mm. entirely a policy within the bank. Based on this 
strength of a lot of the banks that you're making me understand to manage risk. Should Kwame Asante in Abu Sokai, who has a lot of investment in these banks, listen, these strong banks and the banks that you, 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 you appreciate them, should you go and sleep and stop panicking in these times? Yeah. Yeah. So, and and that's, that's why the industry is so spread. There are, and and they, if you go to the banks, again, even their deposit interest rate, just check out the deposit interest rates. There's that all the way down, and their lending rates is all the way up there. So you got to see, what am I looking for? Mm. Am I looking for the safety of my deposits? And so you, I always say that it's three simple things banks do. They give you safety, they give you liquidity, and they give you a return. So safety, if I put my 100 CDs here, 100 years, if I come back, I will get my 100 CDs. If I put my 100 CDs and just on the drop, if I need 70, 70 Ghana CDs, if I go there, the bank will give it to me. That's liquidity. Oh, I put 100 CDs and the bank is making a return. It's not idle. So do, those are the things you balance. Some people just go and they're looking for return. Mm. Now, if you're looking for return, the bank has to put your money to work in order to give you the high return. Mm. And if they put that money to work, your safety is compromised mm. because they've probably given the money to a loan mm. to a guy called George, yeah. who may or may not pay. Yeah. You understand? So if that George doesn't pay, your safety is gone. Mm. If you come and the guy says, you know what, come back tomorrow because I give this money out in a loan, so, so those are the three things that most of the banks play around with. The safest bank would always ensure they give a higher priority to the safety of their clients' deposits. Mm. They also want to make sure they provide their clients with liquidity. Any time you come for your money, that money is in the bank for you. Mm. Then, of course, I have to give you a return. Mm. But most Ghanaians would go for a return. They go for highest return. You have 100 CDs. You're looking for the bank that will give you the highest interest rate. Sorry you will get the interest rate. But when times are good, because that bank giving you the high interest rate has to take your deposit and go to invest in a high risk business. Mm. And if you go into invest in that high risk business and it fails, sorry, they haven't got any cushions for you. So now do I still get from you then in the midst of all these things? And you always make me understand about how strong this industry and some strong banks are. Yeah. Will you still tell your son to hold his a million Ghana cities in the bank? Absolutely. Just make the right choice. Make the right you, you have no alternative. Money must work for you. Mm. And money under your pillow or anywhere else that is not working is a total waste of your time and the time of the society in which you have earned it. Mm. So, as I said, balance what you want. If I want safety, liquidity, or return, what mix do I need? Mm. Put money to work. In terms of this communication and... and with respect to this whole rumors and debt restructuring and all the rest. Let's look at first the banking space. How we manage the communication we're coming from the banks as well, individual banks, communication in the public space. Have we managed it well? Or we can do better? I'm sure, well look, I think the media could always do better. But I'm also saying that there's the industry should, uh, the industry more should proactive? be more proactive. Because I've heard people make some scurrilous comments. Which are not true. Which are not true. Because you actually take a cold look at the books of these banks and they are solid. How take, solid are these banks? They are, no, they, I, and, and I'm not speaking for everybody. Yeah, I know. But we, we had some very raw rumors recently about solvency issues, brink of collapse and all the rest. And it comes back to my question again that I thought that we, we all were in the, in the feeling that never again. But... If someone who did the research on two or three banks' books and comes out and says that these banks are on the brink of collapse and that's systemic risk, I mean, Mr. Andan, I mean, you, you are out, but you, you, you know what happens in the industry. Yeah, yeah. Before you, before any researcher of any kind picks up a solvency, the regulator knows it. And what has the regulator done about it? And especially if it's a solvency that is going to hit a systemic bank. And when I say systemic bank, this bank is so spread that its customers have the relationship with other banks or other banks have lines into them that before you find anything, data that you are going to use for research, the earliest you can get it, probably three months, but the regulator knows it 
literally on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't expect a never again situation to be that the regulator missed it and some researcher went and found that the systemic bank is getting insolvent. No. The never again is that on a daily basis, banks have what we call BSDs, banking supervision returns. God knows how many numbers we've given to them. Mm -hmm. And they are able to piece it together. And thank God for digital and all sort of analytics right now. They should be able on a very quick basis to know which bank is having solvency problem. That's the number one risk. Mm -hmm. And then liquidity then profitability, those ones we can manage. In our, in our quest to prevent the never again, and yeah. I've had some friends in the industry, do you think that the regulator is more of an SSS headmaster, always with the whip out there, or maybe a more conducive environment for all the banks to thrive? Some are saying that in its quest to prevent the never again, maybe it has been very tough on you guys. Some, say some of these toughness could stifle innovation and stifle room for you to be innovative as well. You think the regulator has been yeah, too tough it, on you guys? Yeah. So who are you innovating for? Who are you profitable for? Number one, the regulator is to protect the stability and stability ensuring that the, the, the clients that possess that you are, ne you are innovating around and finding creative ways to make more money is safe. It's safe. So do whatever you need to do within the safe uh, zone. If you do that, nobody will say that you are being hard on them. I think the question of hard, what is really hard? This number, your, your liquidity ratio, li liquidity cover ratio must be this. Your capital adequation must be that. And if it is not this, you have this number of days and these are the kind of assets or liabilities you have which you can trick around to get to that level. It's, it, they are class cut actions. There isn't any ratio that is out of order which hasn't got corresponding actions to take to bring it back to order. You see what I'm saying? If your, let's say, loan loss ratio is very high, there are, there are things you do. One, you know, and, and improve your collection, whatever is out there. Two, of course, review your credit process and don't create new ones. There are several ways. So I'm saying that the regulator holding the meter on every uh, solvency, every uh, risk ratio within the banking sector has levers. Where it is out of kilt, they know what to do to bring it back to kilt. And they give you time. If you're not able to do it, then you're in trouble. And then they will come and sit and help. They have times. There's a, as I said, the banking resolution process in Ghana is probably one of the best in mm. the world. It's probably one of the best in the world, if we implement it as we've written it down. Mr. Ndami is a former president of the Ghana Association of Bankers. As we look at the banking industry, the economy, I am a credit extension and the Ghana City. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition as we talk about banking, the economy, IMF, credit extension, and the Ghana City. Mr. Ndani, can we... With all these things that are happening, there's some more worried about credit extension. Is that a challenge going forward? Um, yes, credit extension, uh, for banks right now, they will be preserving liquidity. I, so that's will, a major challenge. Yeah, so I would want to make sure, banks should make sure that they have significant liquidity to be able to meet any challenges. And therefore, if you are preserving liquidity, you're not going to be in around creating new credits where you need to flow out liquidity. Mm. Mm. So yes, for, to that extent, it could be a challenge, but mm. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a preservation. Goal? It's a mm. preservation of the bank and the economy. Let's talk about the Ghana city. Yes. I mean, for you, how do we get around it in terms of the short-term measures? I know that, that there are long-term structures that should be put in place, but in the meantime, what can we do to even slow the rate of depreciation significantly because of its impact again on savings, its impact again on lending, and its impact again on the cost of doing business, and impact again on corporate governance as well. You see, the CD exchange rate is a demand-driven thing. And the demand is just the insatiable uh, desire of Ghanaians for every Everything that is foreign. We pay foreign exchange for talking. We pay foreign exchange 
for water, we pay for exchange for literally everything in our lives. It, it is just that insatiable demand for everything that is foreign. Mm. It's, it's, and I always tell politicians, don't promise it. If you can't control that insatiable demand, and we don't have an inexhaustible uh, supply of it, yet we have an insatiable demand, we are going to be in this tailspin for a long time. Mm. So the most important thing is to begin to really significantly cut down on things that we pay for in exchange for that we ought, we have no business paying for in exchange mm -hmm. for that. There isn't anything else that can be done. Mm -hmm. There's only that amount of mining that we can do, gold that we can export, uh, services uh, or uh, remittances that can come in. That's just that it. Mm -hmm. We should just look at the pool. It's not as if the Bank of Ghana or any institution has an inexhaustible supply of US dollars or foreign mm -hmm. exchange. No, it's only what Ghanaians enterprises do oil and gas, uh, cocoa, exports. Uh, exports, that's it. Mm -hmm. And we have a very small basket of it. Mm -hmm. And yet, just look at what happens in our lives. Mm -hmm. Literally, every day on the streets, it is demanding for a exchange. So cutting down the demand. Yes. But can in, in, the, in the monetary space, can anything else, Bank of Ghana has high policy rate in trying to check improve uh, returns on CD assets and all those things. Can, I mean, can anything be, be, be done in the short medium if term? You if you improve returns on CD assets, what are you going to use those principal and uh, uh, interest we have earned on CD assets? What are you going to use it to buy? Imported goods? And if you're going to use it to buy imported goods, are you not going to demand foreign exchange? Mm -hmm. It is just not, it's not a choice between rate of return on CD assets and rate of return on foreign assets. No, it is just the basic consumption, whether it's government consumption, household consumption, firm consumption, think of everything that we pay out. Everything is in foreign exchange. It is not sustainable. And we have to have these adult conversations. The food we eat, it's all imported. The cups and places in which we eat it, it's all imported. The car you drive, your, your fuel, think about your spare parts, even talking. You know, we, we don't have a Ghanaian telecom company. So all the text messages and endless talk and uh, telecoms that we use, it's all for exchange. That has to be paid out to the investors. Think about it. It is just that insatiable demand for everything that is foreign, which is what is killing us. We just don't have the supply equation. And once you don't have that supply equation, I don't see any monetary policy measure that can really balance it. Sorry, we got to be brutally true. Every I can man I mean, they can manage essentials. Yeah. You know, it's, it's okay, it's available, but it's more important to buy fuel than to, for you to buy shoes. So I can, I'll give Brazilian them money, hair, or Brazilian hair. I can manage those ones. Yeah. But the guy needing the Brazilian hair is the one that's prepared to pay the 12 CDs to the dollar to bring it because whoever is there will, will, will buy that buy it at any price and they are the ones that take up the rates every every market is doing it they are hiking monetary measure hiking policy rates and all the rest some will say that we've still not come to really understand the drivers of inflation whether it's demand or supply policy rates hike consistently and there are even rumors that bank of ghana might even hike again at their next meeting is that the right way to go i don't think so because the economy is not responsive to it you do those things when the economy is responsive. If you hike policy rates and take interest rates, would people stop borrowing? They Maybe don't. it's working. It's not, well, I'm not sure. Sometimes you do it because that's what the textbook says, mm. but does the economy react to it? Mm. In the US, immediately they pull up interest rate by 0.25%. You will see it immediately. Inventories will go down, uh, people will lay off workers and calm down things. But if you are taking all these levers and the economy is just not reacting, you are on an escalator. Does it mean the inflation then is not a demand driven inflation? It's, it's, it's a something supply else. Thing. It's a supply thing. But the World Bank country director is listening that if we had not hiked this rate, could have been have been around 100% inflation or even 120% inflation. You're just, you're just chasing your tail around. Yes, ch chasing your tail around. I'll borrow at 35%, I'll produce goods and services, I'll price in my 35%, I'll price in my margin, and people are buying it. So you're just in that upward spiral. They should bring it back 
to where we restructure our demand and supply and, and those things. And it has, it, it does, I don't think the banks are safe lending at 35%. And the, money, the guy borrowing is not safe at borrowing at 35%. So really, do you think we've exhausted the monetary measures yes, when it comes so. to checking inflation? I think and so. And it's a fiscal thing right I now. I think so. I think we have. I think, I think the economy is just not responsive. We should hold on to any hike? It's, it's not responsive. To hike for what purpose? Mm. To stop borrowing? To do what? To control inflation, some would say. <laughs> Um, uh, well, that's what I'm saying. The people might be looking at other things, but from a very practical, and I'm not a very practical person, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Look at, from a practical angle, you say, to what effect? You know, in Europe, in the OECD markets, in, in other markets where there is a correlation between monetary activity and the real sector, yes, these things work. But now, there's no correlation between monetary policy and the real sector. The real sector is just carrying on doing whatever they're doing. They're not deterred. If foreign exchange, there are some companies that should have been out of work now. If, for example, you projected uh, your foreign exchange to be uh, six to the end of the year, and then it's 10 to the end of the year, before the end of the year, how really are you surviving? It's because the market is absorbing it and keeping you in business. Because a movement from six to 10 is mm. significant. Ten. So if people are still surviving, what's happening? We have to ask ourselves. Some those are saying things. that interest rates and cost of credit is, 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 is so high in the region. It is, and, and some are saying that maybe it's 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 is a monetary or it's a fiscal thing. If the economy stabilizes and is doing well, cost of credit will come down. Of course, cost of credit will come down if the economy. Is it not the banks who are trying to make abnormal profit? Those high rates you're charging us, where? Credit committee, you know, doing due diligence on a lot of your customers. NPOs are so high. At the end of the day, I George Jaffe has to pay for that. I, I I don't agree, not because I have a history in the industry. Mm -hmm. I think that we instead of asking the hard questions to policymakers and asking hard questions to ourselves, we always would pick out some whipping boy called the bank. And, and do it. And the banks work on margins. The bank works on margins. So let's say that if the bank is working on a margin of 5%, and uh, let's say that interest rates are, or his deposit interest rates are 5%, and he's adding a margin of 5%, lending rate will be 10%. But if deposit, if you go to the bank today and say, T-bill is 25%, by the way, I want 2% above T-bill, and the guy gives you 27% interest to you, and he needs to create a loan with a 3% margin, how much is he lending? 30%. Mm. Mm. So we just have to rationalize the economy at every level. You know, that's what I'm saying. Are we responsive to those macro monetary policy measures? We're not. We're just doing it because it looks like that's a textbook way of doing it. But is the real sector responding accordingly as, it's, as they do in the OECD markets? No. I'm saying if interest rates drop today, in any of those responsive economies, you see production of goods and services go up because credit is cheaper, they go and borrow it. And their rate of return mm -hmm. on creating those new goods and services is higher than the cost of the capital. And for them, when, you're, when you raise interest rate to a certain level where they know that they can't sell, they will simply just drop and bring down. And it is intended that you, know, you cool down lower your inventories, take off some workers, you know, it's part of the stabilization. Those kind of responses that you see operate in mature economies, we don't. We're on a, just an upward escalator. Everything is building in. High interest rates building into a price system. High exchange rates building into a price system. High wages is building into a price system. And it's just on the, it's okay one day. IMF program, how do we ensure that we get the best out of it? Because the banks are a very critical player in all these things. IMF program is really not about banks. IMF program is and about the government. Yeah, you know, it, I just think that what, what is happening with IMF, we, we have a chronic situation where our expenditure exceeds our income at the governmental level. And what we've never done in any IMF program is to, is to dismantle at this point, dismantle that cost structure, that expenditure, to at par or below income, or below our income levels, no. We've always held that expenditure income is here, 
and there's a gap. So we come and we make promises to bring the income up and it never comes up. But what you control is your expenditure. Mm. I've given you your salary of 100 Ghana CDs and you've gone with your wife and you're spending 120. If I say, George, sorry, you've got to, what do you need to do? You sit with your wife and say, no, 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 we can't be spending 120 when we earn 100. So you actually immediately drop the uh, cupcakes, you drop the uh, uh, baked beans, you drop the uh, uh, ham, you know, you bring all, all of it way down to 80. So at least we can have 20 CDs. So when little George is sick, you go to a uh, hospital. But that's not what we do. So we, we go to IMF with a certain expenditure that we are not able to meet. Our income is not matching up to that. So there's that gap. So we, oh, we, we, we always make promises to bring more taxes, to bring more revenue. But you haven't actually brought down the expenditure. And to then we, we agree on a program and say, okay, over the next three years, we will bring that revenue and it doesn't happen. Meanwhile, because they want you to survive, they've given you some grants to cover that gap. And when that gap is covered and you're a bit relaxed, what do you do? You even add on more expenditure. Mm. So you keep doing it for another six years and come back again. Mm. So if you look at the, this uh, IMF program, it's probably like a six, seven year burst because we don't do anything about dismantling that expenditure. The real IMF program is about cutting our expenditure down to much our revenue. In fact, before you call it the IMF program, because sometimes when we use the IMF, <laughs> it's a distraction. Yeah. It's a safe, it's, it's the, call it the IMF is a jakuju who yeah. has come in to tell you, George, you earn 100 CDs. You cannot be chronically spending 120. You are in serious debt. Let's go back to that 120 you are, in, you are, you are spending. Because as for the 100 income, you can't do anything about it now. Mm. But what you are spending, you can do something about it. Because that income, somebody is giving it to you. But what you are spending, you are actually consciously giving it out. So you go back and say, yes, no, I can't be saying it. So you and your wife will sit down and take off things that you don't need. So government should sit down and say, this chronic expenditure, that is, we can never get the revenue to cover. Which of it should we dislodge? And we, no, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. We always keep that expenditure there, Misogyn. take the income and make promises. Or we will introduce this tax. Or there will be this efficiency in tax collection. Or this will happen. And all of that is written into a program. We sign it off. So and then before we draw the curtain, when I told one, Kwame Amwa, one of my friends I'm come to interview you, he told me I should ask you one question. That listen, looking at your experience in the industry, the banking space, if he becomes a president one day, <laughs> he wants you to be a governor of the Bank of Ghana. What do you say to that? Well, I, look here, I mean, uh, that's a very, Kwabna, I don't, I'm not, Kwabna Amor, right? Kwabna I wish him luck. <laughs> yeah. would, you, would you accept this proposal or request? I wish him luck. I, I just think that we have competent people doing the job now. Like no, I'm thinking that when he becomes a president later, not I now. I will have a conversation with Kwabna, uh, Kwabna Mr. Amor, yeah. and, and see what he really wants to do. Mm. <laughs> Thanks so much, Mr. Dani. Mr. Dani is a former banker, president of the Ghana Association of Bankers. And now he's into consultancy. If you need any advice, I mean, <laughs> listen, you can't go wrong with him. Have a great day. He has been PM Express Business. <laughs>